We now come to standard 1B, independence and objectivity. Members and candidates must use reasonable care and judgment to achieve and maintain independence and objectivity in their professional activities. Members and candidates must not offer, solicit or accept any gift, benefit, compensation or consideration that reasonably could be expected to compromise their own or another's independence and objectivity. This is extremely important and the concept of independence and objectivity keeps showing up in other standards also. There is really one core point being made in this standard, which is that we as investment advisors need to be independent and objective. And then the second sentence is just saying that anything such as a gift or a benefit or additional compensation that compromises independence and objectivity should basically not be allowed or should be discouraged. Before going further, let's understand the importance of this standard. Let's say that you write research reports on a few companies and there is a perception that you receive expensive gifts from these companies and then write very favorable reports. So there is the perception that your independence and objectivity is compromised because of the gifts that you receive. Does that hurt your professional integrity? Obviously it does. People who believe that you are receiving gifts and then writing good reports are not likely to trust your reports. Not only does this hurt your professional integrity, it also hurts the integrity of your firm and it also impacts the industry that you operate in. So when one person in an industry is operating unethically or is perceived to not be independent and objective, that potentially hurts the overall industry. You can see that this is an extremely important standard and needs to be understood well. This standard also indicates how independence and objectivity can be impacted and that's shown right here. It could be through gifts, benefits, compensation and so on. As you might imagine in the investment analysis industry or the investment management industry, there will be several external forces which try to influence the process by offering analysts and portfolio managers various benefits such as those shown over here. Let's now look at the guidance and here we will look at the different situations and circumstances where potentially independence and objectivity might be compromised. To help you understand this well, let's just create a scenario. Say you work in the research department of a large brokerage firm and say that this brokerage firm also has an investment banking department, but you are here in the research department and you are writing reports on large pharmaceutical companies. So you evaluate the companies and then you make recommendations as to whether investors should buy the stock or hold on to the stock or potentially sell the stock. Now from or who might try to impact or have an influence on the reports that you write. One is buy side clients and let me just make a clarification here. When you work at a brokerage firm and you are creating reports and then disseminating those reports to a wide audience, you are referred to as a sell side analyst because you are selling your services to other entities. One entity that will use your reports is uh, buy side clients. So an example of a buy side client would be a large mutual fund. So mutual funds obviously have large holdings. Say there is a particular mutual fund that focuses on pharmaceutical companies and say that this particular mutual fund has a large holding of Pfizer stock. Pfizer is a major pharmaceutical company. Now, obviously this particular buy side client, the mutual fund would not be too happy if you 
publish a report with a negative view on Pfizer stock. So potentially they might try to influence you to write favorable reports. Another scenario is investment banking relationships. Now taking this example further, I already mentioned that your firm also has this investment banking department and say the investment banking department is trying to work with Pfizer to do a secondary offering. So this department is working with Pfizer to raise more funds and for this particular service or if the investment banking department wins this deal or this project with Pfizer, they will make a lot of money. Now, what the investment banking department might try to do is influence you to write positive reports on Pfizer. But again, that is not something that you should do. Your reports should be totally independent and objective. Another influence might come directly from the public companies. So Pfizer, for example, might directly try to influence you through gifts or through other potential benefits and encourage you to write favorable reports. Next, we come to issue a paid research. Let's say there is a company that is not widely followed and this company approaches you to write a research report and you are being paid to write this particular research report. Clearly, there will be potential conflicts of interest over here and obviously the company would want you to write a favorable report. Travel funding. Let us say that this company that wants you to write a research report then asks you to visit its headquarters and visit its facilities across Europe and your entire travel is funded by this particular company. Again, that introduces several potential conflicts of interest. Credit rating agency options. We change gears a little bit here and let's say that there is a friend of yours. So this is your friend. He works at a credit rating agency. You write reports on uh, pharmaceutical company stocks and let's say that this friend of yours issues credit ratings to bonds that are issued by pharmaceutical companies. Now just the way you can be influenced or there is a potential for external entities influencing you, similarly there is the potential of external entities influencing your friend. Your friend is issuing reports or essentially giving a grade to the various bonds and the issuer, the companies which are issuing the bonds would want favorable reports and might try to influence your friend. Influence during the manager selection procurement process. Now here there is another scenario. So let's say you have another friend who works at an asset management company. So this particular friend is a portfolio manager and this entity, the asset management company where your friend is a portfolio manager is approached by a large pension fund. This pension fund has substantial amounts of money and wants an asset manager to look after its plan assets. Now, there are potential issues on both sides here. Multiple asset management companies will be vying for this business and there might be gifts exchanged which unduly influence the process. So one possible scenario is you have asset management company one, which is where your friend works and then company two, company three and company two tries to influence the process by giving substantial gifts to the manager over here who is responsible for making the decision. So clearly in this scenario, there are potential influences from external entities. Brokerage houses. Now coming back to the asset management company and the portfolio manager, this portfolio manager is obviously managing funds and when he wants to have trades executed, he needs to go through a brokerage company. 
there might be several different brokerage companies that would obviously buy for this business because brokerage companies make money by executing trades and different brokerage companies obviously would want to get the business from the asset management company and therefore there might be expensive gifts that they might try to give to portfolio managers in order to influence and encourage the portfolio managers to do business with them. We've talked about how external influences might impact the independence and objectivity of an investment manager or a portfolio manager. Now let's discuss the recommended procedures for compliance. And if these procedures are put in place, then that will help ensure the independence and objectivity of the investment management process. The first item has to do with protecting the integrity of opinions. If you have a supervisory position at a firm, you should try and establish policies such that every research report is unbiased and in fact reflects the unbiased opinion of the analyst. You should also encourage your firm to design compensation systems that protect the integrity of the investment decision process by maintaining the independence and objectivity of analysts. If you are a junior analyst and do not have much influence in the organization, then you need to develop your own procedure in order to ensure the independence and objectivity of your work. Next, create a restricted list. Now, this goes back to a discussion we had earlier about a brokerage firm. And I said that you are a research analyst here at the firm. Let's also say that two of the pharmaceutical companies that you are following also happen to be firms that are being approached by the investment banking group within your firm. One of the steps that your organization can take is to put those two firms on a restricted list. And that means that you will not be writing or presenting your opinions related to these two firms. You will simply be publishing reports with facts about these particular companies on the restricted list. And this helps avoid the potential conflict that we discussed earlier under investment banking relationships. Restrict special cost arrangements. Earlier we talked about issuer paid research and travel funding. And we said that there might be a situation where you are doing research on a particular company in order to come up with a report and that company might pay for your travel expenses and perhaps have you transported on a corporate jet, make you stay in lavish hotels and so on, which clearly would impact your independence and objectivity. Or at least there is a possibility that your independence and objectivity might be compromised. To avoid that situation, there should be some special cost arrangements. And what this means is that ideally your company should pay for your travel expenses. If the situation is such that there are no public hotels in the area where you are visiting, then it is all right for you to stay in the facilities provided by the company, as long as the facilities are not too lavish and also if there is no public transport available to the location where you need to travel to, then it is okay to accept a chartered flight offered by this particular organization that you are researching. So we need to be practical. Key point is to avoid anything that might potentially impact your independence and objectivity. Next item is extremely important. Limit gifts and this keeps coming up in questions note that this doesn't say that all gifts are wrong or that all gifts will impact independence and objectivity we need to be careful about determining which gifts might impact independence and objectivity and which might not 
in all the examples I talked about here, where an external influence is trying to impact your independence and objectivity, for example, you are writing the research report and a buy side client, somebody at a large mutual fund is trying to influence you or if a public company is trying to influence you, then getting gifts from that entity would clearly be problematic. However, token gifts, small gifts, such as a company sending a calendar, that is okay. On the other hand, if you are working at an asset management company and your client is extremely happy with your performance and decides to give you some compensation, then as long as you keep your employer informed, those gifts potentially do not create any conflict of interest and they might be okay. But again, you need to make sure that your employer is aware of the gifts that you are getting. When you receive a gift from a client and disclose it to your employer, the employer can then make an independent judgment about whether that gift is impacting your independence and objectivity. Going back to receiving gifts from one of these entities, the recommended procedure is to establish strict limits based on local customs. For example, in some countries, the gift limit might be that anything under $25 is acceptable, but gifts over this value should not be accepted. This would mean that simple gifts like calendars and so on would be all right because one would not expect a calendar to influence the independence and objectivity of a research analyst. The next point is restrict investments. Here you need to encourage your firm to develop formal policies related to employees purchasing equity or equity related IPOs. Just to understand what's going on here, say you are writing a research report on a particular company and you know that you are going to issue a strong buy recommendation. Before issuing that recommendation, you purchase shares in that particular company because you expect the stock price to go up after your research report is published. Clearly, that would be problematic and the company should have policies against such procedures. IPOs keep showing up on the CFA exam and you need to be clear about this. Very often firms help their clients with IPOs and you might hear the term a hot IPO or an oversubscribed IPO. This is where the IPO is extremely popular, there's lots of interest. And generally the expectation is that after the IPO, the stock price will go up. So if people in your organization are involved in this process and they participate in the IPO in terms of buying shares for themselves, then potential conflicts of interest can creep in and the independence and objectivity of their research reports can potentially be compromised. Next item, review procedures. You should encourage your firm to implement effective supervisory and review procedures to ensure that the analysts and portfolio managers in your company comply with policies related to their personal investing activities. Notice that CFA Institute does not put down hard and fast rules. The judgment generally is left to the organizations concerned to put in place the correct policies and procedures so that independence and objectivity is not compromised. Independence policy. You should encourage your firm to establish a formal written policy on the independence and objectivity of research and implement reporting structures and review procedures to ensure that research analysts do not report to and are not supervised or controlled by any department of the firm that could compromise the independence of the analyst. Appointed officer. Ideally, firms should appoint a senior officer with oversight responsibilities for compliance with the firm's code of ethics and all regulations concerning its business. Firms should also provide every employee with the procedures and policies for reporting potentially unethical behavior 
violations of regulations or other activities that may harm the firm's reputation. So those are the main points related to independence and objectivity. I have essentially followed the sequence in the curriculum and in several places quoted from the curriculum. Your job now is to do the various examples. So read the examples, think about the appropriate course of action and then read the comments.